Um, so I'm going to kind of continue on from what Randy said a little bit. Um, and I think you'll hear more about this tonight as you hear the, you know, the other people that went um, to on this trip. Um, but yeah, you'll hear about the system of action detention in this country and how it is a brutal, torturous regime that locks up innocent people who are fleeing war and persecution. And the tragic truth is that many people who, after risking their own lives uh, for the hope of finding a better one here in Australia, end up actually taking their lives. Um, in desperation, um, uh, you know, at their unjust imprisonment. Um, it is not just the particularly disgraceful and dehumanising way in which Serco treats refugees, nor is it just the long stretches of time that some of these refugees pass in utter desperation and confusion that makes the system so abhorrent. It is actually the very fact that people are locked up at all and punished for the crime of um, seeking a better life. And this is why I think RAN uh, will not tolerate any aspect of this system. Um, and we call for an end to all mandatory detention because no woman, man, or child should ever have to spend, spend like a single cent in any of these couples. Um, and I think, you know, this can seem very sort of maximal, but there's actually a really simple solution to this supposed uh, pro complex problem. Um, and it's for refugees to just be processed in the community where they have access to all the services um, and uh, yeah, sorry, all the community services and um, help that they need, um, and that you know, anybody needs, but particularly people who are fleeing from war and, and persecution, and sometimes torture. Um, and so to varying degrees, this is actually how most of the world um, treats refugees. And in fact, Australia is the only country in the world that practices um, a policy of mandatory detention. However, the Australian government did not always treat asylum seekers like this, as many of you know and remember. Um, uh, it was brought in by the Labor government in 1992 and prior to this Australia actually had a you know, fairly ordinary history of processing large numbers of refugees in the community. Um, for example, after the Vietnam War, uh, several thousand Vietnamese people fled by boat, and this wasn't a, an outrage, um, to Australia's shores. And I have a quote from a, um, a RAP activist actually in Melbourne, um, RAP is sort of our sister organisation, the uh, Refugee Action Collective. Uh, he said, they were transferred directly to migrant hostels in the suburbs. Here they were free to come and go, to look for work and even to study at local colleges. They had health checks while they waited for the housing commission to find a place to live and for the immigration department to organise their permanent residency. So this was, you know, not a huge drama. Um, and Oxfam estimates that this crazy plan of treating human beings uh, like human beings would only cost about $63 per person per day. Uh, and in contrast to this, many of you would know just how costly the government's actual policy is. It's like outrageous. Um, you know, it's not just costly to the human beings who suffer um, under the system, but you know, massively um, costly uh, financially. So the government spends hundreds of millions of dollars every year to lock up refugees. Um, in 2007, Oxfam found that they spent uh, $1,830 per person um, per day to lock someone up in Christmas Island. Um, last year it was announced as well that the government wanted to spend $2.5 billion on offshore processing alone. Um, I'm just kind of reading out some figures because they're all appalling and all sense of just how much, you know, just the length that uh, the government is willing to go to to torture people. Um, and there's, you know, an $800 million five-year contract with Serco as well. Um, and so, by my calculations, it costs around 30 times more for the government to lock up refugees in prison than it would to provide them with all of those much-needed services. Um, so, obviously, there have to be some benefits to this system um, if, if, you know, people are willing to spend this much money on it. And I would argue that the benefits are not for refugees and not for ordinary people, but um, for the government. Uh, because obviously the, you know, the Labour Party and the Liberal Party uh, both use the refugee issue as uh, you know, a political football. Um, so the question becomes uh, not whether or not to deport a Tamil man to his death in Sri Lanka, but whether or not you'll be able to get one up on your political opponents if you send him to Sri Lanka to his death or not. Um, and I think broadly the usefulness of the policy is, is beyond just that kind of to and fro. Um, it's, it's scapegoating, basically. Um, so valid discontent from the from you know, the Australian population about um, things like housing and uh, you know, lack of funding to 
um, education and health and all the kinds of things that you know piss people off, rightfully so. Um, instead, we go you know go uh, misdirected towards refugees, um, and it also you know uh, they're able to sort of drum up these racist views about refugees to justify spending millions of dollars on blocking them up. Um, and obviously it's self-fulfilling because then all this ensuing racist fear can lead to um, ideas that refugees are actually, you know, if we let them into the community, they would clog up all these schools and healthcare and, um, and things that people need. Uh, and so it leads to a sort of more popular demand for border protection and deterring refugees. Um, yes. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to just talk about, a little bit about Iran and what our um, sort of approach is, which you know, Miranda went over. Um, but I think, uh, it, you know, to draw, it's, it's based around the idea that we can draw in and mobilise as many people as possible to challenge the system of mandatory detention. Um, and we think we can do this because we can, uh, or, you know, one of the reasons we do this rather is to uh, change the public opinion. Um, so we want to build a grass movement, uh, grassroots movement, sorry, to reach as many people as possible. And we think that there's a large minority of people out there in the community who are, you know, maybe not pissed off, but actually don't kind of see any point to this system when the government could just be spending money on healthcare um, and things that it should. Um, yeah, and you know, polls show as well that the majority of the Australian government is actually to the left of the, um, the, sorry, the majority of the Australian population is to the left of the Australian government um, on things like offshore processing. So I think this gives you um, an indication of what we can achieve. Um, so yeah, Brand's role is you know, not just about visits and providing provide care, but it's about uh, mobilising and challenging um, the system. And this can obviously you know, also put pressure on the government um, to end mandatory detention. Um, and we want to sort of make it too hard and too expensive for them to keep on doing this. Um, yeah, but I think the, the only way that we can actually achieve any of these things and achieve our goal of ending mandatory detention forever is um, by drawing in like lots and lots of people. Um, this is why we uh, you know, seem to hold big rallies. Um, so I'll just end by talking about you know, sort of why Iran came about, um, or why sort of the whole of the refugee rights campaign came about all over the country, which was in response to refugees themselves protesting in detention. And so our protests have always been in response to theirs and always been um, you know, a way of uh, a solidarity, basically, with um, you know, people protesting their own awful uh, treatment. Um, and I think, you know, in the case of Leonora and the, the, um, these places out in the middle of nowhere, that it's our duty to go out to these places and expose some of the, uh, the lies and um, the sort of cover-ups and, um, and just the isolation and break the silence um, on, in these places. Um, and you know, up until 2010, when Iran last went to Leonora, uh, the government was still running with the line that there were no children in detention, uh, and you know, and it was found that there were actually lots of children in detention right here. We can see them. Um, and so, I think that's why the refugee rights campaign in every state has continued to make trips to uh, to these remote detention centres. Um, and I think civil disobedience and direct action as well um, can form, has always formed a major part of the refugee rights campaign. Um, these acts and stunts um, can, and, you know, which I think someone will probably go into um, about what we did at the Leonora protest recently, um, but they can demonstrate uh, to refugees and the Australian public and the government that we do not recognise the legality of the imprisonment of refugees, uh, the legitimacy of the offences, um, nor the authority of Serco and DIA. Um, and so we're not afraid to directly challenge that system um, because we know that the system itself is actually unlawful unfair and um, And I think that the usefulness of this disobedience goes beyond just that kind of symbolism, um, because in the past, it's what has pushed the refugee issue into the spotlight um, with you know, major protests like Baxter and Umrah, um, which really sort of reduced the extent to which um, the Howard government could use the uh, refugee issue you know, as a political football. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll finish now. But um, I think the... Uh, the campaign should continue to visit these Nora prisons and expose the brutality of the system of indefinite mandatory detention. And only through this and our dedication to direct, defiant actions that challenge the Department of Immigration and Serco's authority can we build a campaign of thousands that can ultimately tear down the fences that keep refugees from visit.
Um, so, uh, after we uh, were eventually, we, we went visiting at, at Leonora and our visits were cut off toward the end. Um, and this was obviously the you know, circuit saying, you know, like, all right, there's, there's too many people, they're finding out too much, you know, like, we see a few people here. Um, and so, you know, this was, uh, you know, this made everyone quite angry. Um, and so, a uh, decision was made to, the last night over there, go back to the centre, uh, have a real uh, rousing uh, protest there, and which culminated on uh, many of us uh, climbing up onto the fence to see the young man inside, uh, and quite a few people actually uh, to slap high fives. So, uh, before they were heard me uh, to the sleep quarters by Zerka. Um, so, all of this uh, is Take this through them. You did say you're going to give. Yeah, they yeah, offered. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're yeah, a genius. Yeah, no, Serco offered to take a letter. Bring out Steve. Here's your letter. Where? Get to those kids. Yeah, Can we watch you give it to them? Because last time we came, these guys like ripped them up, put them in the bin, and Diak came in and punished them for it. Well, reprimanded them. So can you please, I'd like to, I'd like you to watch, watch you walk that letter over to them, so that we know they get it. With Serco, they agree. No, I know, but that's all right, They'll, as long as they've got it, that's all that matters. As long as they've got it. It's, there's a policy where kids are allowed to receive letters, they're allowed to receive mail, so would you mind walking it over to them? Can I see you go straight, straight to them, please? I'd like to see it's the same letter that we've actually sent in, given they've told them that apparently they don't want visits. But the promise you <laughs> said well, like we could write a letter. If you <laughs> said we could write a letter. <laughs> One letter after another. <laughs> uh, specifically, I wrote in there we want to visit you, but Serco told us that you didn't want to meet us. when they said that they didn't want to meet us. All the way from Perth, we come a message of peace, we come a, to bring a message that people in the Australian community want to welcome refugees into our community. Oh, hang on. I did. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. yep. Can we come in now? This is yeah, so thank you. I received your letter. We're uh -huh. just getting it translated and then uh -huh. we'll get it distributed to them. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, they seem to have changed their minds, Eric. Go figure. Jeez, you must feel real 
good about your negotiating skills that you've talked them into seeing us. And so we oh, really appreciate the fact that earlier yeah, let me speak you said to us say. we could go in if they agreed. Yeah, exactly. So that's great. So we, I received your letter. We're getting it translated for them so that it'll be in all their languages. Um, about the MP3s, do you have 160 MP3s? We don't. No, we have we, 37. Yeah. I don't know if it's a good idea. Sort of I'm sure they know how to share. They know how to share. What better yeah. than your company, I suspect. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that's happening right now. Can we, um, can we... All day long it's thought control That dark sarcasm all from Circo Hey! Circo! Leave them kids alone! We want to play football! Come! Yeah, Emma. Can we give them the ball, please?
So um, to give you a bit of a, um, a little rundown of um, my new perspective, um, I'll get uh, Leon to come up and speak uh, about his experiences. So Leon's recently involved with the Refugee Rights Campaign.
I went from going where I sort of, I won't say I agree with the policy, but at least in a scam campaign, I thought I had, there must be some validity in my letter saying it was illegal or whatever. That's a whole other issue. But to show that someone from the political change their opinion shows that this is an um,
conclusions to our discussions, particularly on that final day of working, determining what sort of action to take. And I truly thought that was a great sort of example of consensus based um, democracy where we were truly uh, showed that even in amongst all this negativity, that we can still take the moral high ground and do what work out a solution to our So, to conclude, uh, I'm not sure who specifically I should be, should be congratulating, but uh, I'll voice that you made a conversion out of me. <laughs> so, yeah, at, at least that's one step along the way, and hopefully we can grow this movement and really make a difference to this individual's lives.
cowgirl we caravan for. <laughs> we gather to talk about our plans and expectations for the following day. I must admit, a few doubts and questions have been flitting about in my head, mostly around the effect that the convergence has on the detainees in both the short and long term. I needed to be sure that it would be a positive experience for the refugees and not just for our own benefits, whether personal or political. Could it even be worse to go with welcoming messages to give them some hope and support, only to go away again, leaving them there indefinitely, the situation unchanged? I didn't want to voice these concerns at first, not wanting to play the ignorant detractor. Uh, but the meeting that first night went a long way towards addressing those questions. Uh, the stories of people getting in contact after being released from detention to express their gratitude to RAN, for showing empathy and fighting on their behalf. The stories of information on the conditions and abuses they have suffered whilst in the detention system, smuggled out in secret letters. The stories of the hope restored to people in detention know that they are welcome in Australia. These stories from the RAN elders <laughs> show, <laughs> show the undeniable good <laughs> done by these goodies. The next day we're going to be in Nora and McKay and set up a camp at a local airport. Um, incidentally, we managed to kidnap a couple of local kids who were sitting out on their, their big ground group at home. Um, and we joined them to the course. <coughs> We made our first journey down the very long, hot and dusty road to the detention centre. Um, I had seen photographs of the centre the night before, um, so I did expect the endless red dirt and the sea of ugly, beige mountains and the, the oppressive heat. And I also expected the intimidating fences surrounding the compound. But I guess what I didn't expect was the rush of claustrophobia um, that I felt when standing right there, seeing it firsthand. Um, yeah, it's, it's a prison. I guess it just didn't really hit me then. Yeah, it just hit me then. We're keeping innocent people who have already suffered more than most of us can even imagine um, in a horrible prison instead of giving them the bond to support them that any decent person would give them another person. Um, I guess I already believed in the campaign and in ending the mandatory detention, but I just didn't feel as strongly until I saw it for myself. Um, I guess I just feel that we've already got too many public holidays and we don't want to have to keep adding sorry days to the list. Um, yeah, so it's just a very stark reality, I guess. Um, but yeah, I, I expected all that. I expected a lot of abuse and, and horrible surroundings, but what I, I didn't really count on was Serco lying all the time about everything. Um, I guess I've just grown up believing that authority or will, I guess, even if they do harm things, will manipulate the truth or just avoid the whole situation but not like out and out lie constantly. Um, so that was confronting. Um, made the whole thing seem really surreal. Uh, I also thought there'd be a lot more support services for people, like a lot more counselling. I thought they'd be in school, which they're not, uh, with not even any uh, English lessons at the time that we visited, uh, which I found pretty amazing. I thought that while people were in detention, that we did have programs in place and we did have legal and social support. Um, but yeah, there's nothing. Uh, yeah, so that was the first day, and then uh, after much harassing the Serco guards, they agreed to let us see some kids that they spent three and a half hours finding the few kids that they could convince to come 
seals. Um, and they decided to stretch it out over the whole day. So we could go in for a time and see the same kids again and again and again over the whole day. It's been like 10 hours of these kids sitting in a room watching one group after the other, the other come in and probably ask the same questions and they're like, why? Why would we do that? Um, and we figured out when we went to the first visits the next day that they were all uh, Iraqi kids and we asked what the demographic was in the detention centre and the vast majority uh, was uh, kids, kids from Afghanistan and we figured that they were probably uh, only let them see a smaller group, so there was a language barrier and uh, more of a, if they could segregate what we said to them um, from the other kids. Uh, so it was all very controlled and contrived, and certain guards were in there. Like, we started out with two guards in the first meeting, and they gradually worked their way up to like seven or eight, and that was very confronting. Um, and we asked them to leave. And we're happy with that. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess the whole thing is just really surreal. Um, yeah, so when we exhausted our visits, uh, it was late at night, and we didn't really want to, to cause a mass amount of trouble because they had agreed to visit us as lonely as they were. Um, I mean, towards the end, we got to see the other kids because I think word spread through the detention centre and they insisted on seeing people. And uh, once, once they knew we were there to support them, they were really responsive. And I think that was really very reassuring for me to know that they did want us there. Um, yeah, and then, I don't know if anyone spoke of the tennis balls they were there. Yeah, um, so the, the only part of the, the compound that had one fence, like a single fence, um, separating us from the kids, was the back. And they just happened to be playing soccer that night. And I don't know whether they thought that um, we left on Saturday night or whatever, but they said all the cops home. And there was like two circle guards in the and no cops at all. And we walked up and like, we could have just pushed in and like, walked straight through. It's like, oh, it's five o'clock, I'm going to go home. <laughs> okay. um, so we climbed up the fence and started throwing tennis balls over and chanting, and all the kids, just, and all the guys rushed up to the fence and were running up and down and high fiving us, and we were handing over notes and, and all sorts of things, and they were just so, like, they were yelling back, and, and the enthusiasm was just so amazing, and that was the first time I really knew that, that they didn't know what that what we were there for and they did appreciate it and they were receptive and everything that Sir Cope was saying was absolutely bullshit. Um, and yeah, so that was just so invigorating, so exhilarating um, to actually have that response. And we all got back to camp and I don't know, I know for myself I was like still high on adrenaline and like wanting to go break down some fences or something um, to like work out the, the rest of us from that night. Um, but yeah, I went to, went to bed. <laughs> yeah, tickled around my sleep. Um, I got up the next morning and we went to have our last say, say goodbye. And oh, and Juliet told me how to write love and freedom in Arabic. That was on my phone. <laughs> we wrote all the tennis balls and threw them um, Yeah, so the next day we went to say goodbye. We had a sign. Um, that had everyone's names on it that couldn't make it, and um, so we had our photographs, and yeah, we just said goodbye, and, and yeah, we all, we all sort of trickled back towards the bus, and that was the first moment that I kind of teared up a bit because um, yeah, just realizing that nothing had changed, that they were still there, and that we were going home. Sorry, I'm not usually this emotional. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was really cool, I guess. Um, and we got back to town, and, and after being with everyone for so many days and having a 
Like, I think a couple of people were discussing it earlier who have been on trips before about how when it's over, you can feel very isolated and alone because you're with all these people in close contact for quite a few days and you're all focused on the one cause and you're, you know, very caught up in this world that's, that's away from your normal reality. And go off the bus at East Bath and everyone's like, away. I was left with a few people and got back to Perth and was walking around the city by myself and I was like, I'm so alone. Where's all my family? Um, yeah, and so that was a really bizarre feeling, like coming back to reality after being in this weird, surreal world of what's, what's reality, um, who's telling the truth, um, what's the actual situation here, and yeah, getting back and getting back used to. to um, Normal life. I you know, called into bed with my sister and made a couple of me. <laughs> but, um, yeah, at the end, I guess I could really see the benefits in going. Um, I know it certainly cemented my um, dedication and it did. Well, I hope it gave hope to the refugees. Um, but then the information that we got and the media coverage and it's bringing it out to more people. So I think it was positive. It's just very confronting. Place to get to. 
um, of the zip of the lamp. And that's when he told me that he had had three community meetings with the young children and young men there, and not one of the 160 wants to see it. And I said, well, that must be a consequence of the tension that I had come across professionally before. Because we're visiting people in other circumstances, they do want to see visitors just to break the monopoly apart from anything else and have gifts. But that was the way we left it. But when we were protesting at the gate, and those young men, as you saw, saw us and the, the word from down the camp that something was happening, Circle were forced to allow us to visit. And I was in the first group that went in. For, we were allowed to go in to see, it was supposed to be nine young Iraqis, and the event it was seven to begin with. Four of us went in. We were to stay for an hour, and then we were to leave again. They had a set up like an official visit where they had a big long table and chairs on each side. Um, when we were seated, the young men came in. And I immediately thought, no, we're not going to sit like this. This is just playing the game really with official visits. So we indicated that we wanted to sit in a circle and pull their chairs back and they followed. The seven people didn't have any image and they were obviously handpicked for reasons that would just make it really difficult to communicate. It's never ceased to amaze me how human beings can communicate with our language. In the first five or twenty minutes, we were able to work out that they all were Iraqis. They were aged from 14 to 17. Most of them had been at Christmas Island in Darwin, so they had travelled Australia through the detention centre uh, system. They had been told there was a protest coming because Ran made sure and asked circle to tell them there was a protest coming. And they did. But they didn't say whether it was for them or against them. Uh, <laughs> so you, these young people were waiting in fearful anticipation. And one of the first questions they asked us was the police. What are the police for? So we had to explain to them that the police presence was for us and not them. When the young men first came in, they came in and they presented in a way that I'm really familiar with, detached down, compliant, complacent. But it never ceases to amaze me when I'm working or dealing with or having the privilege to be with vulnerable people. How quickly they're empowered when they recognize your good heart. And with, in a very short period of time we had this exchange and they were showing immediate signs they wanted to communicate. And this is where Miranda said they named a young man who had perfect English, Farsi, and Arabic. They, the guards didn't want to say, no, you seven have to stay here, we're not having anyone else in. But they said they wanted to go to the toilet, and they put so much pressure on that this, uh, this interpreter came in. And that made just the communication that much easier. We able to find out how many were orphans, how many had no parents, how many had family members abroad, um, and I was just thinking from a developmental point of view, the eldest was 17, the youngest had just turned 14. Now the Iraq invasion was 2003, so the eldest one there was 8 when that happened and the youngest was 5. Prior to that happening there was the awful consequences of the embargo. And that's what these people had been through before they actually started what must have been a horrendous trip because we didn't, didn't want to get into the details of their actual journey, their exit from Iraq, their whole journey of how they ended up as both people coming into Australia, going to Christmas Island, going to Darwin, and now they ending up in Leonora in the middle of the desert. But what that means for their, for their actual development, not even to think about attachment issues, unaccompanied children. In that whole experience, there was no adult that was there for them looking after their interests or just comforting them. These are 160 young people, totally alone, having yet another experience that is telling them, you have no worth, you have no value, nobody cares about you being here and we will call you by number. Now it's very, very dangerous to tell anyone they've got no worth and no value. But for that to be a repeated experience for them, formative time in their life. It's absolutely dangerous for them, but also for those of us who want to live in a society where people are treated with respect and with worth. There were moments of 
laughter and mirth, because that's really important too, because we don't want to tell them you've only got one story. <laughs> and that's sort of all accompanied a traumatized person who's stuck in the middle of the desert. But in between times, there was very poignant moments where we noticed, for example, evidence of self-harming. But I think the most poignant moment was where a young man looked and he said, Australia, is it worth this? This was before we had the interpreter, so we're talking about pigeon English. And from his demeanor and the way he spoke, I took what he meant was, is it worth struggling to try and stay alive? Is there hope? And it made me think about how I use this when I'm teaching. How about brain falling? You know, as, as uh, mammals, what we share of all mammals is we, we respond to threat and to danger in the same way. And the first response is the brain stem. And sometimes if we're continually having to face threat and danger, we don't get past the brain stem. But if we do, it goes to the emotional brain and then the cortex. But it's the brain stem that is the initial response. And as I say, all mammals share that. And the three responses to threat and danger are flight, fight and freeze. Now these kids can't fly, go into flight. They're in lockdown. They're in lockdown with Serco, who by the way were found guilty in the High Court in England last year, in the UK last year, of abusing children in the detention centre. Um, they were using tactics that they call distraction, which was to jab, to jab them sharply in the nose in the lungs and to twist their thumbs back if, um, if they were showing any signs of anger. So they can't go into flight, fight. Now if you've got guards who are using illegal ways of distraction, which is a rather interesting word, then you're more likely to go into self-harm rather than actual aggression. And the last response is freeze. When you can't fight, you can't show aggression, you're limited in how you can self-harm, you can't get out of the situation, you just close down. You go into yourself, the form of sadness, depression, and from what we know is the consequence of the freeze response over time is probably the most dangerous because it's the hardest one to get back out of. So this is an event, this is a process that is happening in this country, that is having lifelong uh, repercussions with these people. They're being emotionally tortured, really. Um, the other thing that struck me was babies aren't born with a knowledge of how to be human. Largely we learn it and we learn it through imitation. Again, what are these young people learning in their life? First five years or eight years of their life? What did they learn in Iraq? What did they learn on the journey? What did they learn when they hit Australia? And now what are they learning of certain guards who um, are calling them by numbers? It's just repeat, repeat traumatization and messages. You have no value, you are of no worth. But to see them in part, and as people have said during the day, word got out which totally blew apart the lie of circles at. Nobody wants to see you. Not one of them under 60. So we ended up having I think at one point there was about 10, 10 or more people just going, because they couldn't control it. They literally just, I think, ended up letting people come into the room because they couldn't control it. And the action that we did that night, I think was so successful because all of those young people had seen how persistent we were to, uh, in our um, challenges to circle to actually see them touch base with them in the day. But I think from my point of view, seeing how they responded to our reaching out to them is hugely important because that is an anchor of health for them. That is an anchor of, yes, you do matter. Yes, you have value. Yes, you do have worth. And I've certainly worked with people who have survived the most toxic childhood family experiences. And they have said that one person who believed in me, who reached out to me, made a difference. Now those young people had maybe 40 of us. And that is a huge memory and is something to build on. When we had the debrief that night, I just I had an image because I'm very visual of the 
Fidel Castro when they had the huge celebration in Havana for the winning of the revolution and the dove came down and sat on his shoulder and it was a moment of, of great symbolism and meaning, particularly for people who were quite superstitious because the dove is descending and staying on his shoulder means you're here and not one. So that became known as the night of the doves. And I said, we just had our night at the tennis balls. <laughs> <laughs> May not be as epic. <laughs>